Hi there, I'm Don Kettle, and I'm at the LBJ School at the University of Texas at Austin. And today we are lucky to have a chance for a conversation with Steve Goldsmith, who is the former mayor of the city of Indianapolis, but also the author of A New City OS, which is a very sharp and perceptive look at how cities can be managed, how in fact they need to develop a new operating system. And if ever there was an argument for trying to make a case for that, it's certainly in the middle of the current fire cell break that we have now. And, and Steve, I wanted to begin with a question about the problem of leading change in cities in particular. We've we made arguments for a long time about the need to develop good strategies for leading change. What, what kind of lessons do you have both from your experience and also from your research about how to make that work? Well, um, let let me do this uh, being efficient with your time. So obviously there's some basics in terms of leading change, right? You have to have a champion for the change. You have to have a champion who's going to inoculate those who work for him or her, who make mistakes. I mean, some of those things are pretty straightforward. But if you look at it from the city level, I think one additional item to pay particular attention to is what are the source, there are two actually, what are the sources of information that one, we, that one accesses to advocate change? And if you are a mayor or a department head or a county executive, and all of your information comes from your appointees, then you're going to become soon, even if they're loyal appointees, uh, uh, confined by the information that comes up. Right. So that's one issue. The second and most uh, an even bigger issue is imagination. Right. I run a program for chief data officers in 25 large cities. About six months ago, I got them together and said, what's your biggest problem? And to, uh, unsurprisingly, but it surprised me at the time, they said the quality of questions I'm getting from our, our boss, right? So how can one imagine solutions that are different than the activities we utilize today? And in that last category has a subset to it, which says, you know, in a city in particular and in a county, problems are horizontal, agencies are vertical. So by definition, it, your innovation requires you to think across the agencies, right? People do not live in the parks department or the health department or the street department. They live at 10th and Main. Their problems are experienced in their communities. So, so leadership and innovation require broader access to information, more imagination, and the ability to think horizontally is contrasted to, to a vertically. And let me try to ask you a little bit more about how that fits together, because we have this, this problem in public management that people tend to think about leadership as being somebody in charge at the top, giving orders to the people at the bottom. And the model that you've got, and in fact, this new city operating system you're talking about, as you say, is, is much more horizontally developed and oriented. I mean, how, how does a mayor at the top or any kind of urban leader construct these horizontal collaboration systems that, in your mind, have to be at the core of making things work? Well, so let's deal with your first point, which is leadership. You know, this is not me. This is kind of Harvard 101. But, you know, leadership is not positional. Uh, I had a class today where a woman who worked for me when I was deputy mayor of New York, her name was Lolita Jackson. She was a mid-level bureaucrat at the time in a mid-level uh, agency, it was appointed by me actually and the mayor to run a team to mitigate the harm that was being produced by the Second Avenue subway. So she got folks from all of the applicable agencies and she led by knowing more, being better prepared and having a very specific plan of execution. Now she had my authority supporting her, but but she was a leader, right? She was a leader and it's her leadership that accomplished it. So I want to be careful that when we say leadership, we don't necessarily, I know that's not the way you meant it. I'm just kind of agreeing sure. with you, right? But, and then the next thing is, um, I, I think if we, I've been looking at a little bit of like this and Don, we had this conversation before in terms of how one thinks about spatial, uh, spatial innovation, right? How do you think about organizing innovation around a place? So as a, a, one way to create the horizontal thinking is, what's the problem? Okay, the problem's homelessness. Well, that requires um, more shelter, it requires domestic violence, it requires better jobs, it requires uh, uh, access to uh, substance abuse, mental health, whatever the, you know, that's, so, so let's organize around a problem. The other is let's organize around a place. How do we make uh, life better for the folks who live in a poor community? What do they need? Let's bring those groups together. And then uh, that is not enough, right? Because the performance measures of those teams need to be uh, overarching, right? Just to go back to my real quick example about my class today, you know, Lolita noticed that the sanitation department 
uh, evaluated its officers about how many, how many um, tickets they wrote per day, when the problem wasn't tickets being written, the problem was how to solve the rubbish that the construction workers are leaving behind. So long way of saying performance measures, culture, clear mission, uh, organization around one of those two uh, areas perhaps, and, uh, and maybe a, and a data source that can help you look at data analytics, predictive analytics, and identify the drivers of change. And one of the things that it just kept coming up repeatedly in the answer that you just were discussing is the role of technology in collaboration. We sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes I think wrongly, think about collaboration as a kind of rich, only interpersonal thing. But so much of what you've just described has to do with using technology and innovation to try to drive those partnerships. I mean, what's, what's your view on that? And Because I, I know that's an important part of the operating system that you're describing. Yeah. Can I share a screen for two minutes if I promise not to give a boring PowerPoint talk? Absolutely. All right, just a second here. Oop. So just real quickly, we'll just do this for a second. Um, so one way to think about this uh, is the following. Um, so you've got um, how to use technology to support the new operating system. And let me hypothesize the, these four blocks that are at the bottom, Don, and talk about how technology drives it. So one's the user experience, right? How, do, how does the, the, the person who lives in a community or how does the field worker for a city, how do they get information? How does that information deliver to them? How can they use that information to understand transparently what's happening in their community? Or if they're a worker for the city, how do they use that information for purposes of predictive interventions? How do they, how do they relate to and gather information from the communities and the stakeholders? How is that organized and delivered to them? A second one is to say, you know, when we see a lot of this in the, in the current virus situation, how do we act in real time? How do we use uh, IoT data? How do we use sentiment analysis? What signals do we get early that allow us to move quickly and act in time to solve a problem? It could be basic, like a, a mechanical piece that's going to break and has an IoT sensor, but I'm thinking about it broadly in terms of how we get information. And then I think probably... The most important way to think about this, particularly in terms of the terrific work you do at the LBJ School, Don, is the following. We have a number of public servants who, are, who have for too long been asked to do commodity work, routine work. You know, inspect building one, then inspect building two, inspect restaurant one, then inspect restaurant two. How do we give that field worker information that says to her, uh, whether she's a cop or a child welfare worker or an inspector, here is a family who is at high risk. Uh, here is a building that's more likely to burn down. So how do we improve the discretion of our public servants so that they can act in time uh, and solve these problems? So that's one way to kind of think about the uh, answer to your question. And so what there really is, is this combination of technology and collaboration that lies at the heart of things. And that's one of the things increasingly that I think we are moving to. And that's at the core of your, your notion about the, the new information and, and operating system that's driving government increasingly here. Yes. So uh, these are important lessons because as I'm listening to you talk about this, and I'm thinking about it in the context of trying to deal with the, with the virus crisis, it's the, the importance of leadership and the fact that so much of leadership doesn't have to do with position, but has to do with the way people behave. It has to do with the imagination to try to understand problems and define them in ways that can drive action, to try to think about the way in which government organizations operate in terms of place and not just in terms of programs and neighborhoods, and the way that technology can drive the way that collaboration happens across boundaries. And that, that's a pretty powerful and potent collection of, of strategies that you've just laid out for us in the last few minutes. Well, the, the basic issue, both in the book and I think in governance itself, is that we have developed a form of progressive government, progressive in the way we manufacture government, not progressive in the goals of government, that is based on routines, right? The way we produce, reduce the, the risk of abusive discretion is by reducing discretion. But today we have the tools that allows us to give much more information to the worker to allow him or her to, re, to react and then to actually manage the, the, and, and evaluate the exercise of discretion. So broadly listening to the community, organizing the data to inform decision making, we have tools that are much more dramatic even than you know, six, seven years ago when I was in New York City. Uh, 
This has been just a terrific conversation. Uh, Steve Goldsmith, a professor at the Kennedy School, former mayor of Indianapolis and author of A New City OS. Thanks so much for being with us. These are just great lessons and ones that I know are gonna be continuing to roll out. We need to pay much more attention to even as we emerge from the lessons that come from the virus. Thanks so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Don.